Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Happy Hour webcast from WhiskeyCast.com. I'm Mark Gillespie in the WhiskeyCast studio in the charming yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. Kind of wet today, though. The last couple of days we had the uh, remnants of Hurricane Zeta blowing through here, and it's been just rainy, nasty, crappy. Good whiskey drinking weather, though. Hope you've had a good week as well. Hope you missed us. I know we missed uh, the last... Uh, few days of not uh, doing webcasts with you. And before we get started, I'm just going to get this out of the way right now. Bader, the Wonder Puppy, will not be making an appearance on the show. As we saw, if you saw it on Twitter and on our Instagram feed earlier this week, um, yes, we acquired the puppy that I referred to in our webcast a couple of weeks ago with our friends from... Uh, <sighs> My Lemon Green Distilling down in Texas. Bader the Wonder Puppy is still out in California with Mom and uh, his, uh, well, I guess you could call him his Aunt Tessa, our daughter who's out there. They'll be back in a few days, but Bader's not quite ready for prime time yet. Uh, so Bader will not be making an appearance on the webcast today. So just go ahead and uh, let's get that out of your system right now because I knew somebody was going to be asking about that. You want to add your comments into the show? We'd love to hear from you. We're already getting them. You can uh, post your comments on YouTube and Facebook. If you're watching on Periscope, go ahead. But if you're watching on Twitter, as I say all the time, don't post any comments or questions in the tweet that this video is in because we will not see them until after the show. Graham Frazier, our buddy in England, points out that with clocks going back an hour last weekend over in the UK, he nearly missed this week's Whiskey Cast Live. The U.S. changes our clocks this coming Sunday. Don't forget to turn your clocks back so we can get yet another hour of pre election fun and games. Uh, Chris Ratcliffe says, Evening to all the blended friends, single malt fiends, and those with a wry sense of humor. Ah, Crumpler, time to pour a drink with you, fine people. And uh, Dave Kuhn points out this was one of the fun things to look forward to while working from home. Now, we gave you some good news, but I want to give you just a quick update before we bring in Wright Thompson, our guest for today. Um, we got some bad news from our pal Brett Ferenc, the Scotch Trooper, over the uh, weekend this week. Uh, Brett, as you all know, is fighting a battle with pancreatic cancer and was being treated this week at the uh, Mayo Clinic and was going through some treatments, and uh, they found some... Uh, Bad juju, if you want to call it that. Uh, Jar Jar, which is what he nicknamed his trooper, his uh, tumors as a Star Wars fan. Um, Jar Jar has uh, developed a few cousins, and he's heading back home to Atlanta with his family. We've posted the GoFundMe link here, and we want to wish Brett and his family all the best. Uh, cancer's a bitch, folks, and uh, we want to try to send our best wishes out to Brett. Uh, we also send our best wishes out to... Uh, Bridget Kalen, who appeared on the show a few weeks ago as well. Uh, Bridget has been diagnosed since her appearance on the show with breast cancer, had surgery a couple of weeks ago in Louisville, and she is recovering as well and doing really well. There is also a, a GoFundMe set up for her as well. Search that out if you can help out. Uh, we know things are tight right now, but uh, trying to help our friends out as best we can and uh, sending all of our love and support out to our good friends around the whiskey fabric. For the record, I am drinking Oban 14-year-old scotch today, and uh, you will, of course, find my tasting notes for it at the WhiskeyCast website. But now, and as Watchman 999 points out, vodka sucks and so does cancer. Yep, that, that it does, although I would prefer to have vodka over cancer any day of the week. And uh, Dave Kuhn's pointing out he needs to uh, reach out to Brett. And the comments keep coming in quick and fast. And uh, please feel free to share that news. Uh, share with us what uh, your comments and what you have to say. Hi, David from Tasmania. Alan from Barstow, Flor Bartow, Florida, the ethanol distillery down there. And uh, I want to tell you real quickly before I bring Wright in, because I don't want him to start blushing on camera. I had the privilege of reading Pappy Land a couple of weeks ago. You will find my review for Pappy Land on the website at whiskeycast.com. Suffice it to say, it is one of the best books I have read in a long time. Not just whiskey books, but regular books, period. 
uh, among the entire universe of books out there. If you read it, you will learn things about uh, the Van Winkle family and the history of Pappy Van Winkle and stuff that uh, I never knew before. And I've known Julian the Third and Preston Van Winkle, his son, for a number of years now. I've interviewed them both, and there's stuff in this book that I did not know. Um, I highly recommend it. And uh, with that, I want to bring in Wright Thompson joining us now from his home in Oxford, Mississippi. Wright, how are you doing? Man, I'm doing great. Friday night, heading into a college football weekend. I know you were drinking uh, beer a few minutes ago because you've been working outside all day long, still drinking Budweiser. But if you feel the urge later, feel free to pour yourself a glass of something special. A hundred percent. Like I said in the introduction to this, this was a hell of a book. Oh, man. And I know you spent three years working on it. I got to ask to start off with, how did you convince Julian to spend three years with you? Because... I'm lucky if I can get 10 minutes with him. I just sort of never went away. I mean, it was, I think if I'd have told him in the beginning what I was after, he was no way he would have gone for it. But man, just a little, he was like the frog being boiled in the pot of water. Like, I don't think he really fully realized what was happening. So, I mean, it's, uh, uh, but I just sort of moved into their family. I mean, you know, it, one day, you know, one day he looks up and I'm just, Sleep it in the house, you know. I mean, uh, so I just, I, I just sort of moved in. How did you make that initial contact with him, though, and uh, convince him to do this in the first place? I met him at a party, uh, like some after party at the Atlanta Food. I knew Preston before, but I met Julian at uh, the Atlanta Food and Wine, uh, some after party, and it was like it was a in an Indian restaurant, it was bourbon and birani or so, was the theme. And uh, uh, I just remember thinking like, this is the happiest guy I've ever met, you know? And so I, uh, it, it started there. And we had some mutual friends as a chef in Oxford, Mississippi named John Currents, who's friends with Julian. And there's a food writer named John T. Edge, who's friends with Julian. Uh, John, uh, I'm the executive producer of John T's TV show. And so like, I just, it, it, you know, it, it, you know how that goes. It's a pretty small world once you slide into it. Yeah. John Curran's uh, big bad chef on Twitter has yeah. uh, been on the show before and does his Oxford bourbon festival. I assume oh. you went to that a couple of years ago. Oh yeah. I mean, that's <laughs> drinking bourbon and then bidding on expensive bourbon is a super dangerous combo. Did you uh, bid on the Parker's heritage that night? I mean, don't tell my mom, but I don't really remember at the end what we were betting on. I mean, I knew when Mac Nichols called up to get my money a couple of days later, I was like, ooh, damn. I'm ooh, only what? asking because I donated that bottle from Parker. For, it was one out of our collection that we donated to support that auction, and I was glad to do it for uh, uh, for the kids down in Mississippi. Hey, but uh, They raise a, like, you know, that, that thing is legit. I mean, they raise a lot of money for oh, a yeah. cause. I mean, it's interesting. Uh, I mean, some of those bottles, I mean, the prices start going. It's really something. Dave Kuhn points out uh, one of our audience members, John T. is great, and Jerry Slater is one of his best friends. Yeah. And you know Jerry, right? Yeah. And Marcel Dion, I'll be opening a special bottle of scotch uh, when his radiation therapy ends at Christmas, doing November with gusto again. Marcel, cheers to you. Hang in there, buddy, and keep the fight up. And... Uh, uh, Graham Frazier, I've developed a pension for Armagnac. It's his first calibrating dram, so that's what's first in his glass tonight. Always important to have a, a calibration dram. Spirit Bomb, Tabitha in the UK, drinking the Cheetah, as it's quite a good way of moving from sake to whiskey. That's a great way of putting it. So, what did you learn, first of all, writing Pappy Land about the Van Winkle family? Without... Uh, Giving away a lot of spoilers, I gave away a few in the review, but what did you learn? Well, I mean, one, I'd always assumed he was just sort of inherited all this and was a boy prince, you know? Uh, and that's just not the case at all. I mean, it, it, the real story of the, the Van Winkle family and whiskey is that Pappy built something that uh, 
was sort of ripped away from Julian's father. And then Julian spent, you know, from 1981 when his dad died until, was it 2002 when they did that deal with Buffalo Trace? Something like that, yeah. I mean, he's that's a long walk in the wilderness. I mean, a lot of people don't realize this. Uh, I didn't even know this. This year, Julian is finally paying off the last of the debt. Wow. Like, everybody think like, this year, he's in the black. And this has been the most sought-after whiskey in the world since 1996. Or bourbon in the world, you know. And, like, that's how deep in the red he went to try to keep this family thing alive. Is that the, he's paying it off now, as we speak. And, uh, I mean, so I didn't realize that. I mean, it, it was interesting... Uh, Julian's wife, Sissy, his sister, Sally, his son, Preston, and his daughters uh, have all, independent of each other, said to me, they learned things about him in the book that they didn't know. And that was, I mean, that's the ultimate. Everything now is gravy. Like, I feel like I got the guy right. You got him. Yeah, I mean, there's one story in there where, as you pointed out, everybody, everybody in Kentucky thinks Julian is royalty. And that royalty was maybe gold plating on top of a lot of debt, as you point out, because uh, there's a story that you tell in the book, and Julian's probably going to kill us both for me repeating it here, but they're members of the Louisville Country Club, oh, but yeah. Sissy's taking the kids out to the car during the summer days at the pool at the Country Club to feed them PB&Js because she can't afford to get them a meal in the clubhouse. Well, and it, it, it's, you know, there were a lot of times when the whiskey almost ran dry. I mean, it's interesting that the success of Pappy means that, I mean, Julian has this superpower that he doesn't really get to use anymore. I mean, Julian's ability to blend barrels and sort of predict what things will taste like is pretty astonishing. And so, I mean, it is interesting to think about that long time in the wilderness, like you're talking about the parking lot of the country club or whatever it was, or, you know, when Julian, there were a couple of times where he just thought, well, that's it. I can't get, you know, there's no Stutzel Weller. I can't get any old boom. You know, like there is no, this is it. This is over. And I mean, there were a couple of times where I think it felt very, very close to being over. And uh, I mean, that's what's so amazing now. I mean, I would love, to just give Julian a bunch of barrels from a bunch of different places and say, can, can you just make a whiskey for me and my friends? Like, can you just blend this to, cause like he's a genius at it and he almost never, he almost doesn't have to do it anymore. And like, I mean, that's, so you ask things I learned, I learned a million things. Uh, most of them having nothing to do with, with, you know, the real granular, details of making and bottling and selling whiskey but that's one of them is that he does have this superpower it's not just myth and reputation he's really really good at it. yeah yeah that's what surprises a lot of folks is that even though he never made a drop of the stuff oh, he, he has this that. innate skill that yeah, is, yeah, is you're born with yeah it's a palate and preston has it too by the way i mean it's yeah. interesting preston probably has a better palate Julian just has such a, I don't know how you describe this. He has such a strong sensory memory for what Stitzel Weller tasted and smelled like. And so, you know, you know this. I mean, if, if they're not one of six or seven whiskeys at a place, Julian's going to get a vodka tonic. You know what I mean? Like, like, he knows exactly what he likes and has no interest in things that he doesn't like. And I, I found that really, I liked being, it's intoxicating to be close to someone who has so much faith in, in, the, in their own sense of what they like. And when you look at Julian, when you see him at uh, Whiskey Fest or at one of the rare appearances that he makes at Whiskey Festivals, everybody treats him like a rock star. So. And yet he is the guy that was holding this god-awful dump of a bottling plant together in Frankfurt 
or in Lawrenceburg, rather, been out there with duct tape and bailing wire and calling yeah. Jimmy Russell for help, and nobody ever knew it. No, and the, the thing that's – there are a couple of things about that that are incredible. I mean, one, uh, you know, he's bottling anything for anyone who will pay him to bottle it because he has a bottling line. You know, uh, he had this funny story about someone who left a rag in the dump tank, and uh, a truck came in to dump like a guajillion gallons of vodka to bottle for somebody in Ohio. And uh, all of a sudden it, it starts raining vodka and it's in this super old funky bottling plant. It used to be a distillery. And Julian was like, when they finally got the thing turned off, they went in there and all of the boards were clean because it smelled like a sawmill in there. It had just, that vodka had stripped away 90 years of grime off of every piece of wood in the whole place. You know, that he had all this old technology that the actual bourbon world had long ago abandoned. You know, it was like he was driving a Model T and everybody else was driving an AMG Mercedes. And he used to talk about how, I love this about the old school bourbon community. Jimmy Russell had his guys at Wild Turkey, the old guys still knew how to fix all that stuff even though they didn't, you know, even though Wild Turkey hadn't used that, in, you know, since Cotton was a boy. And so he would, Jimmy would send his guys to go fix Julian's stuff. And I just, you know, out of respect for Julian, out of respect for Julian's father, and especially out of respect for Pappy. And like, I, I you just love that on a certain level, those old school guys, like, uh, yeah, David does show you that vodka is bad for you. Uh, when you were like, uh, vodka is better than cancer. I was like, well, it depends on what kind of vodka and what kind of cancer. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the, uh, but uh, I love those old school guys and how much that they look out for each other and how much it's a tribe. Yeah. I mean, one of the, one of my favorite interviews of all time was sitting down a few years ago with Parker Beam and Jimmy Russell about a few minutes after Parker Beam had just been given the first Parker Beam Lifetime Achievement Award by the Kentucky Bourbon Hall of Fame and sitting down with those two and just shooting the breeze for about half an hour. And just to hear those two, and this was when Parker was still fighting ALS and but could still talk and was still able to get words out. And it was tough listening to him just because those of us who had interviewed him before knew what he'd sounded like when he was healthy, but just looking over at Jimmy and seeing the love that Jimmy had in his eyes for his friend Parker. Yeah. I mean, it's just amazing. Yeah. I mean, like these guys have been like, the guys have been doing it a really long time. There is that it's really interesting. Like how much they sort of see each other as coworkers as opposed to competitors. And we've got a great comment. Crumpler is one of our just, for your information, right? Crumpler is one of our smart asses. Uh, Y'all keep bringing up this vodka substance, and I still don't know what the hell it is. You mix it. With, you mix it with tang. <laughs> and Crumpler lives down in Virginia, so he can say y'all and get away with it. I mean, so where in Virginia? It depends. Crumpler, where in Virginia? I think he's down south of Richmond. Oh, then he can. He can. I mean, I lived in Southern Indiana, and I can't. I can say it only because I lived in Texas for a few years, but I still can't get away with it. I mean, being from being in Oxford, Mississippi, you get. It. Let, let's explain. Y'all is plural, right? It is. It is you all. Because we have a lot of listeners in uh, Ireland, in the UK, all over the world, who don't quite understand this, and they think it's just a Southern thing for. Uh, just a, a way of, of speaking and it's a, it's actually a plural there's a whole yeah, dialect it, around this it's a, it's yeah it's you it, it's an it, it, it's a contraction for the grammar for the grammar fans it is a lot better than use hey use guys and as dave keen points out much better than use which yeah, or yinzer. we got any yinzers on here Pittsburgh? yeah oh yeah we got a few and since i live in new jersey i get this stuff use all the time and just outside of Philly. Graham Frazier wants to know, I, I'm assuming you did read the Sally Van Winkle Campbell family book. And, and, and you about, talked with her, right? Oh, yeah. I know, I love, I know Sally really well. Uh, yeah, I did read that book. I love that book. And in many ways, uh, reading that book was super freeing because uh, 
I just realized once she did such a good job that I didn't feel like I had any responsibility to tell a linear history of the thing. Like it, in some ways it, it freed me up in my mind to just write it almost like a buddy movie. You know, I mean like here are the four years, here's a story of the four years in which Julian and I became friends. And like on a certain level, it's that, I mean, it's funny. The first time I described it, uh, my grand literary theory of it to my wife, she was like, Oh, Oh, uh, you wrote eat, pray, love for dads. And I was like, shit. Yes. I mean, don't tell anyone that, but I mean, it's not, that's not totally unreasonable. Uh, Oh, there we are. That's at Julian's house. And I'm assuming you guys are drinking just straight bourbon on the rocks, right? We are right there drinking. It is bourbon on the rocks, and it is that is a. I think Let me pull that, that shot back up. I think that is a nineteen a nineteen sixty eight Stitzel Weller. Oh my god! So barreled in sixty eight, bottled in eighty four. Holy shit. Yeah, it's real good. Oh, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've had some of the, the old Stitzel Weller juice that um, the current owners of the distillery have bottled under Blade and Bow, and you tell that whole story from uh, the night they had the launch party. That was part of Chapter 1, but still. No, this, no, this is the real thing. I mean, I was at Julian's basement one time, and he handed me one of those, like, old, old, I mean, now they would call them, like, blue caps but just like an old, old quarter pint bottle from Stutzel Weller that was white dog from like 69 or 70, I think, off of the Stutzel Weller still. And it was smoother than a lot of stuff people, you go buy in a liquor store right now. And it was moonshine. I mean, it was unbelievable. I mean, I was sort of like, I can't believe. I mean, it was incredible. Like if moonshine tasted like that, you would never need to go to a liquor store. Yeah, but if moonshine tasted like that, yeah, we would have, I mean, nobody would be in business, but no, the revenuers would have just had a field day. No, I'd, well, I'd have a still out in my yard. You use it? Oh, I said I would have a still. Oh, I would, yeah, so would I, yeah. I'm sorry, I couldn't quite hear you there. Yeah, yeah. Um, we do have a uh, discussion here about the use of y'all. Um, Ricker points out, in Texas, they use y'all for one and all y'all for more than one. I was always taught that all y'all was uh, actually more of an insult. Yeah, I don't, you know, I say you for singular and y'all for plural. <laughs> We're going to leave it at that. By the way, uh, excuse my French, but all y'all is usually followed by the word motherfuckers. Yeah, that's what I was saying. It's one of those ones that's usually led by an insult. And all it's perfectly okay to say that. Yeah. yeah, yeah all y'all yeah. was something, yeah. It was basically, yeah, it was, it was fuck y'all, y'all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And fuck you, and fuck you, and fuck you, and fuck all y'all. It was sort yeah, of like that. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And since we are streaming, it is okay to say that. I and do uh, whatever I want. <laughs> so he's, and Rick, and Watchman's pointing out, so I bet Texas wishes this social stream was called Y'all Tube. Right, that's good. <laughs> That's you're, good. We'll give him credit for that one. Right, that's, you know, so you're, your your experience, though, is not limited. And we'll get back to the Pappy Land book in a minute here. But your experience with whiskey is not limited to just Pappy and bourbon. Um, I know that you have done some stuff over in Scotland as well. You've been over there. And uh, I want you to tell some of those stories as well. Well, I mean, we, you know, we so when ESPN broadcast the Open Championship, uh, I wrote... Uh, Anything you ever heard the actor Ian McShane read during the broadcast, I wrote and produced. And so we would go over there. It was a, a friend of mine who's a director, uh, Tim, and we usually had uh, the same crew, camera crew, and we would go over there. I mean, like we did fun stuff. We like so I must have gone to Scotland, I don't know, a bunch of times doing that. And so we would. Uh, I went to Oban uh, in that little town there. Uh, Yep, yeah, open at 14 right here, just the, uh, hanging out. You know, we uh, they gave me the claret jug one time to go, to go. Uh, we were in St. Andrews, and they gave me the claret jug 
so that we could go film with it, sunset, and then keep it overnight and sunrise. And so the bar I love in St. Andrews is the Dunvegan. It's like right up from the course. Uh, my friend Jack used to own it. Uh, he has he sold it recently, but uh, I texted him or called him was like, "Hey, I'm bringing something in." And we went in the bar, and I just put the claret jug on top of the bar, and then we just sat down and started drinking, and you know, let people pose for pictures with it, and you know, we just sat in there all night with the claret jug. Uh, now we but had, did you drink out of the jug? Uh, here's what's interesting. Uh, it has a hole drilled in the bottom so that you cannot drink out of it. Oh, that sucks. There you go. How about that? That's your that's your fun fact, because I was 100% going to do it or make a bong from it or something. <laughs> you know? And like, uh, no, 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 no. They, they, they saw us coming a mile away because I was going to go get some claret because I'm the cliche monger in the room. I was like, well, we're 100% going to drink out of this. Mm -mm. Uh, get some anyway, gum or something and stop that sucker up or put a finger in there or something man but, no i sort of felt like you know we had the, the the amount of papers we had to sign to get this thing i was like nope there's a hole drilled in it they don't want me drinking from it i'm i don't need to get a call from an 860 number in bristol connecticut firing me because i've destroyed the claret jug you're not going to destroy the claret jug. It's been around longer than both of us have been alive, for crying out loud. It'll be longer around long after we're gone. I know. It's, it's like the Stanley Cup. You get a chance to drink from the Stanley Cup, you don't oh, screw that up. No, in hockey, they do they do crazy stuff with it. I mean, oh, I yeah. you know stories. I mean, just filthy stuff with the Stanley Cup. Well, they used to. Now they got a guy that travels with it with white gloves, and they don't let him take it to strip clubs and bars anymore, and nope, throw it in the pool. Either. I'm not trying to be like a, a Stanley Cup deep stater, but like 100% that cup is still getting into some shenanigans. Oh, I believe it completely. <laughs> but as Bill Ricker in Boston points out, in this new world of epidemiology, the hole seems very wise. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <sighs> this is our audience, gang. So... What whiskey do you enjoy? What, tell me about your first experience with real whiskey. Not moonshine, but real whiskey. Uh, I mean, Steel and Maker's Mark for my father. You know, I mean, and still, you know, I have some really nice bottles in my house. And, uh, but I mean, we, you know, I drink them. Uh, but like, I have a decanter on my bar of my house and there, it, Maker's Mark is in it. Uh, and, uh, you know, I really like it. And I mean, I like weeded and I think you just like whatever you go, grow up on, but I mean, just, you know, that, that's sort of what was around. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I still, I still, that's what I'm buying unless it's something crazy and, you know. And, uh, with that, I mean, Bill Samuel senior got the idea for doing the weeded bourbon from talking to Pappy. Well, I mean, it's so interesting to me that, so, I mean, the, the whole history of bourbon is that farmers moved from New York and then to Pennsylvania, and that's why there's so, that's why there's rye in so much American whiskey. It's all out of Pennsylvania, whiskey rebellion. And so what, what I think is uh, really interesting is that Pappy was the first person, he didn't invent weeded bourbon. There are a couple of different, I mean, it's hard to pin down but he was absolutely the first person to mass produce and sell a high-end aged weeded bourbon. He was, you know, the first sort of big time mass market weeded bourbon was Old Fitzgerald starting in Derby Day, 1935. And it's so interesting because if you drive around Kentucky, I mean, you don't see any rye. In fact, so little rye is grown in the state of Kentucky that the USDA doesn't even list it as a crop. You know, what you see a lot of in Kentucky is wheat. And so one of the things I think that's so interesting is that one of the things that Pappy did was sort of shake the Pennsylvania out of bourbon. And uh, so, you know, I'm, a, I'm big into the metaphysical idea that, that, that whiskey isn't just, whiskey making isn't just a science, but an art. And that, that they're ghosts in the bottle. And I think that those weeded bourbons to me, 
feel of their place. They feel of Kentucky in a way that rye bourbons do not to me, because rye bourbons to me feel like some sort of cultural holdover from Pennsylvania. They both have their place. Oh, of course. I will, I will agree with you that uh, weeded bourbon to me is just a lot easier to drink. I mean, it's and, one of those ones you can sit there and drink that all night long. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, you know, and it, like so much of the book is an exploration of Kentucky and the idea of Kentucky. Uh, I mean, like, I didn't know that, you know, like, so I didn't, I hadn't really thought about it, I guess, but I didn't really think about the fact that, you know, Kentucky was not in, K Kentucky was a union state. There were 100,000 Kentuckians who fought for the union and 30,000 Kentuckians who fought for the Confederacy. And so when you talk about how much of bourbon is tied up in the myth of it, I mean, it's sort of perfect that bourbon is made in a state that now pretends it lost a war it actually won. Like, you know, there's that great Churchill quote that like the, the, the Irish remember the defeats long after the English have forgotten the victories. And like some of that is true in Kentucky and like all of that is tied up in the history of bourbon. I think that's, you know, I mean, the very beginnings of American bourbon are tied up in sort of Jeffersonian versus Hamiltonian ideas about what the American economy should be and what America should be. And, you know, have you read, uh, read Mittenbuehler's book, Bourbon Empire? Oh, yeah. That's Reed's a, been on the show, yeah. That's a great book. Yeah. And, like, that was, I had all of these bourbon history books that I wanted to read before I started doing this. And I honestly, I read that one and then I just stopped. Because I was like, well, that's, you know, this is the one book you need. And, like, he has this unbelievable scene in there of George Washington having to go up and fight the Whiskey Rebellion and his denture, his false teeth are cutting into his gums and he's just old and tired. And like, anyway, that, that book is really, really fabulous. Yeah. Reed did a great job with that. That's, book. That book's so good. And we start talking in that whole same era about uh, the issue of slavery and whiskey connections. Yeah. And folks like Nearest Green and people who were really connected through that whole period. And I still don't think we've come to a reckoning on that yet. And I bring that up only because you talk about bringing up your daughter, Wallace, in yeah. Mississippi yeah. and trying to uh, teach her as she's growing up, because uh, she's still a little one, about yeah. how, how you get past this well, and, and how you deal with race. And... Yeah. Yeah. In, in the South and in whiskey and in life, really, right? And just that, like, you must know the history first. And it is important to see yourself clearly and to interrogate your own myths. And I mean, that, is, that, that feels like such an essential part of, of life, certainly life in the South, but also of bourbon, you know? I mean, uh, you know, there's a certain strain of bourbon selling and that the whole point of which is for you to never be able to figure out what's actually in the bottle and where it came from. Uh, I and mean, one of the reasons I love Julian is he loves when somebody calls him a whiskey maker to just be like, no, 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 never made a drop. And he's like, I don't, you know, he doesn't know how to work a still, you know? And I, I find that no, few bourbons in the world have more of a mythology than Van Winkle. And so to see Julian interrogate those myths and then to do that myself felt certainly interesting. I hope it's interesting for the reader, but it's also, it also felt essential to try and understand what Pappy is and what it isn't. You know, what, what it is seen to be and what people want it to be and what it actually is. That's part of what drew me into this book was this whole mythology of fatherhood. Yeah. And we talk about trying to follow and trying to get the approval of our fathers as men growing up. You talk in the book about Julian III, the current Julian, trying to uh, get the approval of his father, who was trying to keep uh, Pappy happy, for lack of a better term. 
and then compare it to your own family and your own father and your uncle and your own struggle with fatherhood. Um, I don't want to spoil it for the reader, but you and your wife had some issues with infertility. Yeah, which is... And thank God I, that's been solved. Yeah, you know, everybody out there who has, is going through it or has gone yeah. through it, that's no joke. Yeah. Uh, but to have not... But to have fought so hard to have kids and to have a child. Yeah. What did you learn about yourself writing this? You know... You know, I went to see Bruce Springsteen's Broadway show. And one of the things he talks about in there is uh, you can, and he's, he brought this up in talking about his own father, but he, you can either be an ancestor for your children or you can be a ghost. You know, you can either fill them full of confidence and wonder and belief and toughness and send them out into the world prepared to be their best version of whoever it is they want to be, or you can wrap your own shit so tightly around their ankles that they can never make it to the surface, much less go anywhere. Yeah. And we talked really eloquently about that. And that really struck a nerve with me. And certainly as I was thinking about what are the things, and as Julian was thinking about like, what are the things we inherited from our fathers that, that, that are deeply important and that we want to make sure make it to the next generation. What are the things that should die with us? And, how do you be an ancestor and not a ghost? And uh, that was, I mean, I, you know, that question is certainly one of several primary propulsive questions in the book is trying to sort of sort out what you owe your father. You know, I mean, like what, what is required of a father and what is required of a son? I mean, in Julian's case, I mean, was it required of him? Did he owe his father and Pappy to go down with the ship as opposed to sort of getting out of the bourbon business. I mean, I would think he would tell you that in hindsight, he thought that maybe he did, uh, you know, what, like, what did he owe them and how much, uh, of his current success flows out of whatever karma you build up by trying to fulfill, fulfill that promise. You know, I mean, like, those are certainly, I mean, there's certainly things that he thinks about and that we explore, you know, that we explore in each of our lives and that I explore in the book. What strikes me, though, is that you talk openly and honestly in this book about the screw ups that Julian the second, Pappy's son and Julian Van Winkle's father and will I'm, I'm referring to him as Julian Van Winkle here just to keep the lineage straight. But uh, Julian II, Jr., Bruh, let's call him. Yeah, exactly. You used a term in there about, and I'm going to quote this literally and pardon my language, about fucking up the baton pass. Yeah. And I used that in the review, and I expected to hear some, I expected to get some grief about that, but I didn't. But that's essentially what happened, and it wasn't Julian II's fault. It was really it wasn't another family member who forced the sale. Well, and, you know, look, and maybe they were right. You know, I mean, they, they've spent a lot of time, I think, in the Van Winkle family trying to understand that. And the whiskey business was in the tank. It was spiraling. No one was buying bourbon. Uh, there was no possible way of predicting what was to come. I mean, ultimately, that still was taken apart and sold like three years before Julian got the 99. I mean, if Diageo would have held on for three more years, you know, but there's no, you can't blame them. That wasn't a bad business decision. No one knew. And, you know, if we could predict the future, we would all be riding around in Gulf Streams. And so, you know, I'd have a huge airplane out there. And so it's interesting in that someone, I mean, Julian's aunt, I think, wanted more, uh, uh, wanted, you know, was living off this thing of value they had and w decided that, you know, this was a business and that it wasn't some weird nostalgia play. And, you know, if Julian would have run Old Rip like a business, it wouldn't, uh, I mean, it, they wouldn't be here today. I mean, he just kept, he just wouldn't let it go. And 
you know, it worked for him. I, it, it becomes interesting. Everybody has to decide on their own what they think the right thing is to do and what they owe the past versus what they owe the future. You know, like what is what was Julian's responsibility to his father and to Pappy versus his responsibility to those four children? I mean, like those are really, really complicated questions. As I noted in the review of Pappy Land, I've I've had this own discussion myself internally over seeking my own father's approval, and he died about eight about six years ago, in 2012 or eight years ago now in 2012. And I'm thinking, you know what? It doesn't matter to me what he thinks because he's gone. I want to be there for my kids. It, it, it's interesting. I mean, because, you, you know, ancestors and ghosts. I mean, it's the whole thing. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And by the way, uh, there, you can have lots of different answers at lots of different times. You know, I mean, you can change. You can, you can know what the right thing to do is, and then, you know, it's that great scene from the Sin of a Woman. I knew what the right thing was. I always knew, and almost unequivocally, I didn't do it because it was too hard. Yep. You know, I mean, that, like all those things are really interesting. I mean, eat, pray, love for dads and sons, fathers and daughters, fathers and sons. I mean, that's not far off. I mean, I, you know, I'm not going to say that in public much because it's embarrassing, but like, <laughs> but I mean, that's not a terrible description. It's not like Tuesdays with Julian or some Mitch album thing that or was, something well, like that, that. That was going to be the title. You're kidding, right? Yes. Of course. I'm I kidding. hope so. Yes. Let's uh, quick question, question now from Chris Radcliffe. I don't know what's in the book, but how does the family see this meteoric rise now in the booming secondary values, and how attached are they to it still? I know they're attached after reading the book. Way more attached than you could really know, and nobody hates the secondary market uh, uh, more than Julian and Preston for a variety of reasons. Yeah. One, because he doesn't think the whiskey's worth that. Oh, no. And it infuriates him. He thinks it's worth what it's priced at. He thinks a bottle of Old Rip should be fifty nine ninety nine. And I mean, in the world I want to live in, I have Old Rip in my decanter uh, uh, instead of Maker's Mark. I mean, that's what I would like to do is just go home and that's what you drink. So, you know, also all of the confiscated counterfeits get sent to Buffalo Trace. And so, so Julian tries them. It's pretty funny because he was telling me one time, most of the time it's crap in those bottles, but someone they think either stole or made the actual capping machine. And so you can't tell the difference. There is no difference. It's the exact same machine they'd be using in the factory to put new caps and the seals and all that on there. And so these fakes are incredible. And what Julian was telling me, he was like, yeah, I just had this one and it wasn't, Pappy, but it was whatever it was, it was really good. Uh, but you know, he was laughing, but that makes him crazy. And when you read the book, one of the things you'll realize is that the thing that they're after, I think most of all, is he's on a kind of memory quest. Now that there is no more Stitzel Weller in the world, not really. And except what's in bottles, there's nothing in a barrel anymore. And uh, it's gone. And the ability to recreate it is gone. I mean, the laws are different. You can never do that barrel proof. They, they, the, the, the mills are gone. The still is gone. The Julian thinks the yeast is in a warehouse, is in a freezer in New Jersey, which is funny. Uh, and some people think that Maker's Mark has some of the yeast, but I, it, you know, who knows? But, uh, but you can't ever make it again. And so now, what he wants is he is trying to put whiskey out in the world that makes him remember that taste and smell. And so it's a deeply personal memory quest. And each bottle is a tiny piece of that whole world that his father and grandfather had and then lost. And so a counterfeit whiskey, even if it's delicious, if it isn't trying to be that memory quest, he has no interest in it. And in fact, 
it is deeply upsetting because like this is a really private, intimate, personal thing that they're sending out into the world in every one of these bottles. When I was talking with the Diageo folks last time I was out at Stitzel Weller a few years ago, they told me the stuff, the stills were still there, but they wouldn't let me go into the still house because they claimed, well, there's asbestos concerns. I mean, is that true? I, I believe it because the folks I've talked to had never lied to me before. Let me put it that way. Well, and why would they? That's a stupid one. And then if yeah, it's so, rare, that's really, I mean, like, it would be interesting to see if you could do it. Yeah, because they've said the stills are still there. Everything is still in the place in the still house the way it was when they shut it down in 92, 93. Edwin Foote, God help him, who was the distiller who closed the place down, is still alive. And... The only thing they've said, because I asked if I could go in there and take some pictures, and they said, no, um, we can't let anybody in there because there's asbestos all over the place. And, yeah, that's legitimate. Because a lot of those distilleries had a lot of asbestos around back in the day because of fire. And, and also, so anybody that produces Guinness, they're all right in my book, so I'm just going to assume that we should trust them. So, in theory... If there's any way to, and they've said that it would cost so much money to remove the asbestos that reviving Stitzel Weller doesn't make any sense. Otherwise, they would have done it a long time ago instead of dropping $130 million to build the new Bullet Distillery over in Shelbyville. Yeah. They would have spent the money at Stitzel Weller instead. Yeah. So, when you say there's no more left... Do we know that? We, nobody knows that for a fact because nobody knows what Diageo is sitting on. But, because they still release orphan barrels, although now they're releasing orphan barrel whiskeys out of Scotland now. And so that leads me to believe that they don't have any more Stitzel Weller juice. Where would it be? And like it would have, it couldn't be in a barrel. It would have to be in steel Demi Johns or, you know, I yeah. mean, uh, and as you point out in the book, it could very well be up in Gimli, Manitoba in Canada. And also, like, it, it, well, yeah, I mean, this is what's crazy. So 2% of the Crown Royal blend was Stitzel Weller bourbon. That's what they were doing with it. I mean, that's unbelievable. I mean, Julian was talking about, well, like, it's not, you don't want to make any one person look like they were bad business people because they weren't making bad business decisions. Julian was going around banks in Kentucky trying to get loans to buy barrels of Stitzel Weller. And he couldn't, almost no one would loan him the money. Like, you know, it, it wasn't that like, there was one idiot. I mean, it was like, no one knew. Yeah, today you'd have no trouble getting that financing, but 20 years ago? No, he couldn't do it. I mean, no, like uh, no Kentucky banks, who knew his last name wouldn't do. Yeah. He you know, knew his, well, his last name and his family reputation and uh, what yeah. was lying around there. Yeah. I mean, if a Van Winkle couldn't get a bourbon loan in the state of Kentucky, you know, I don't even know what we're doing anymore. One of the stories you, t the, the basic focus of the book is around the 2017 Van Winkle releases, because those were the first that had Buffalo Trace juice in them. Yes. And you followed Julian and this memory quest that you referred to a second ago in his goal of trying to make sure that the whiskey that Buffalo Trace is making for him now lives up to that. Yeah. Do you think he actually got there? I 100%. I, don't, I know he got there because I was sitting next to him. And you know Julian. I mean, He's not winning Academy. He's not Jennifer Lawrence. You know what I mean? He's not winning. Uh, uh, he's not winning Academy Awards. He was jacked. I mean, he was so jacked uh, that, I mean, for one of the only times in their family history, he had a barrel of it bottled. You know, like it, it was. It's really good, and he was really excited that. 
I mean, because that was the day that determined whether this would keep going for generations or whether it was going to end. I mean, that was it, you know, and because if he didn't like it, that's a real problem, yeah. you know, I mean, an almost insurmountable problem. And uh, they were giddy. I mean, it was really cool. I mean, re I'm sitting next to him with a notebook open as he tasted, and that's in the book. I am jealous as hell. It was so cool. I mean, if you're like, oh, yeah. like, like, it was like, you know, it was interesting. You talked about the pricing yeah. for the Van Winkle releases and how pissed off Julian gets. I noticed a few weeks ago when they sent out the news release this year that they not only, he and uh, the Buffalo Trace folks, not only encouraged folks to avoid the secondary market, but to go so far as if they found a retailer that was overcharging above the suggested retail price, that they call their state attorney general and report the SOBs for that. Yeah. Which is good. You know, I mean, some of these prices are crazy. I mean, no bourbon in the world is worth a thousand dollars a bottle. Oh hell, there's a liquor store less than a mile from my house as the crow flies that for more than a year was selling a bottle of the 10 year old old Rip Van Winkle, the $59.99 bourbon that they'd put the list price on. Those some bitches were selling that thing for $699 a bottle and 99 cents. And I looked at him and said, how the hell do you people sleep at night? Well, the answer is some coked up Wall Street banker comes in there one night and buys it. And like, but it's just crazy. Like th there's, uh, it's really wild to see. Uh, I didn't know this. We were at one of those whiskey fest, uh, in the one in San Francisco and they were giving away, they had a thing. First of all, people drank two bottles of 23 year old in like eight minutes and 50 seconds. Jesus. They were pouring it. It was unbelievable. And then they had to scratch the labels. And I was talking to Preston and I was like, hey, what are you doing? And he's like, we're going to throw them away. And if you don't scratch the label, people dig through the trash and then fill them with something and resell them themselves. And I was just like, oh my God. So in a lot of ways, I was super naive about all of this. Uh, as Ricker points out in Boston, the folks near our house have to live with total wine in their backyard. They can't make a profit or anything high volume. Total Wine doesn't get any Van Winkle. You're not going to see Total Wine and more getting a Van Winkle bottling. So, no, that's not it. These guys got their hands on one. And there was a, another store about three miles from the house that did the same thing. And I got my revenge on those clowns a couple of years ago because they were selling a red a Middleton Berry Crockett edition that was normally supposed to be about $200 a bottle. And they had screwed up and mispriced it at 85 bucks a bottle. And I bought that sucker right off the shelf. That's it. Yeah. Middleton's good. That's, uh, that is the whiskey of choice of Mr. Pat Riley, since we're talking about Kentucky. You know, it's interesting. I mean, like every dinner I think I've ever had at Julian's house, the nightcap is red breast on the rocks with a twist. I mean, almost every single dinner I've ever had. Yep. You know who else is a big red breast fan? That would be Mr. Bruce Springsteen. We have shown pictures on the website of uh, Bruce going into the Long Haul Pub in Dublin. Oh, I, 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 last time I was in Dublin, I went over there just to get my Bruce. You I love in, that pub. You live in the great state of Bruce Springsteen. so. But Bruce goes in there and they give him his own bottle of red breast. And I'm going to show you this real quickly. So uh, enjoy this because this is the first time this has been shown anywhere because let's acknowledge that Red Breast is a sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Oh, I didn't but, even know that. Like, I swear to God, I didn't even no, know. No, 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 no. I'm acknowledging it for transparency, but watch this and enjoy. This is the new Robin Red Breast, their spokesperson, Billy Layton, their master blender, sent me this this week. Hiya, Mark. How's my favorite New Jersey Red Breast fan doing? Look, I'm going to address the elephant in the room right away. We both know your podcast is dying for a co-host. And I know just the lad who can be the Robin to your Batman. How's that for dropping a hint? That oh, is Robin Redbreast. That's unbelievable. 
That's unbelievable. And thank you to the guys at Redbreast for doing that for us. We have not featured Robin yet on the show because they're still crafting the custom whiskey cast based spots for Redbreast. What? I mean, then to take the time to do that, you must be moving a lot of whiskey. I will like, tell you this story. We have not told this story publicly. Oh, let's have it. This is good. Okay. The very Redbreast has been with us as a sponsor for almost 10 years. The very first year, back about 10 years, almost nine, 10 years ago, that they came on board with us, they came back to us after six months and said, would you guys have any objections if we switched the advertising over to Powers? And we're thinking, uh-oh, we've screwed up. What happened? And they said, oh, no, oh, no, it's not that. It's just that since we started advertising with you, we sold out of our entire U.S. inventory of Red Breast. There's oh. none left in the U.S. for that year. See, we can't advertise. So we, that's why we, and they, they didn't do it. But that's, that's what they told us is that basically after they started advertising on Whiskey Cast, they sold out of the entire year's allocation for the U.S. market. I went to a U2 show one time and uh, uh, got in. It's a long story and this is name droppy. I apologize. I realized that after hey, I Hey, go ahead. We got in, I, I got invited to sort of like this super like pre show party and everyone who went, it was the. They were playing at the San Francisco 49ers. Uh, uh, shut up, Chris. Uh, we were playing the San Francisco 49. They were playing Who's that? You two. Chris was making fun of me. Okay. Uh, uh, it was a good joke. Uh, and the uh, they were playing at the 49ers stadium, and so there was some party up on the roof of the stadium, and everybody went in and got a U2 labeled bottle of Red Breast. Uh, and Very meant, cool. And then I meant to. Uh, I got all these plans, but I was going to take it on and put it in my liquor cabinet. But uh, we, uh, unfortunately, I opened it in the stadium that night, and then we drank it. So that never came home with me. Uh, but no, like, yeah, they, Red Breast should get Julian to come, to, like, barrel pick. And, like, that make a big be thing out of it. Because, like, he loves it legitimately. Oh, yeah. No, uh, yeah, I would love to see Red. I would love to see Julian get together with Billy Layton because together, I've had all of the Red Breast Dreamcast releases so far, but that would be really cool to get Billy together with uh, with Julian. And they would just like each other. I don't know Billy, but Ju I mean, like you know. Julian's hey, I got I got to yeah. ask because uh, since that idiot McGregor got himself into the whiskey business. You're still catching hell over that piece you did on him for ESPN a couple of years ago, right? I mean, sort of. It's weird. Uh, uh, by the way, I was at Julian's house in Michigan the day that ran, and all of the live TV I did about that story was from Julian's porch in Michigan, which is funny. Because uh, Julian kept walking through the shot just to mess with me. Uh, but... It was interesting. I did. I, I caught some crap, but they were also. Uh, I mean, the story became some sort of weird shibboleth about your socio your socioeconomic place in the Irish food chain. You know what I mean? Uh, and so, like, some people were like, "This is a fictional Dublin," and other people like, and then other. The day the story ran, some of the people in this who were quoted in the story were arrested on their way to kill some other people who were quoted in the story. And so it was just a, it is interesting how that resonated. I think I led the nightly news. And like, when you have my job, you don't ever want to, I led, I led the nightly news in Brazil too. They were really mad about something. And like, when you're leading the nightly news, that's not good. Like that, that's, you know, that whole thing about all publicity is good publicity. No. Anybody who says that shit has never been ripped on the national nightly news for a country because it sure doesn't feel good. <laughs> As somebody who's both been on the other side and been the one delivering the ass rippings, yeah, oh, it's Andrew. never good. Oh, and by the way, like, if anyone in the world is fair game, I'm fair game. You know, I mean, like, I had my say in front of millions of people. Like, anybody who wants to have their say should 100% be able to have theirs. I oh, mean, yeah. You know, like, I don't know if this is still true with beat writers, but like when I was covering teams, 
the code is if you write anything remotely negative, even if like the next day is Sunday or it's your kid's birthday or it's your day off, you show up so they can yell at you in person because I got to say what I wanted to say in the daily newspaper. Yep. And so Clayton Kershaw or whatever should be able to say whatever he wants to me. You know. Another story I don't tell very often, back in my early radio days in the mid-80s, I was co- working in Detroit radio and I was covering the Detroit Pistons. And I managed to piss off Rick Mahorn and Bill Lambeer the same day and go into the locker room with those two after the game. Yeah, that's no good. Uh, yeah. One of my favorite stories, uh, there was a playoff game the Pistons were in, and you know, Les Miles, who was the football coach at LSU and is the football coach at Kansas now, he was an assistant then for Bo Schimbeck back at Michigan. And so he and another guy got some sort of like VIP passes and went up to the playoff game and they were walking around after the game, like in the bowel, like the, you know, in the concourse underneath the stadium. And they looked in this room and they saw it was about to be Chuck Daly's post-game press conference. So they went in. I mean, at this point, Les is either the offensive line coach or maybe the coordinator. I don't know. And they sit down in the middle of the room and are just like, let's see what this. And then Les who I love, who is an insane person, just couldn't help himself. And coach, and then he asked like the most talk radio, aggressive question you could possibly think of, uh, the kind of questions he hates now that he's a head coach. And uh, (laughs) Chuck Taylor was like, what paper are you with? And now he's panicking. And so Les goes, I'm with the Michigan Daily, which was the name of the University of Michigan student newspaper. And the other coach with him is like, dude, we got to get out. Somebody's going to call Bo. Like, this is, we got to go. So anyway, that's my favorite Palace at Auburn Hill story. I didn't, I went to Indiana. Well, that's a cool town. Yeah. Bloomington's cool. Oh, I love it. They got, uh, there's that, what's it, the, what's the pizza place downstairs? The English Hut is the burgers. Yeah, Nick's, Nick's, Nick's is the uh, the bar to go to, but uh, there's a pizza Mother place Bears that, was the pizza place I loved. And But there's another, like, late night crappy pizza place, like, a couple of doors down from Nick's. Oh, yeah, I know the one you're talking about, but I, like I forget the name too. of it. I like that place a lot, too. Anyway, go ahead. Sorry, with Indiana. But I was back there during the Bob Knight days. Oh, I've been yelled at by Bob Knight. That's quite the thing. So have I. Yeah. I took his coaching class. Really? Yeah, he teach. He, at the time, he taught an eight-week coaching class in the fall semester before the start of basketball season. He'd teach it during the first half of the semester before the season started. I lasted one lecture. No kidding. What was it like? Oh, I'll tell you. You walk into Assembly Hall. You go down into this dungeon down in the, in the bowels of Assembly Hall windowless room he locks the doors behind him as he walks in now i'm 6'3 and i go about 240 or so he is bigger than i am he's huge people don't realize how big he is oh yeah and he stands i'm i'm dumb enough to sit in the front row i talked my way into the class as a radio tv telecom major Because I conned the uh, department chairman of the physical education department into letting me in the class because I'd said, look, I may be considering a career in sports casting. Who better to learn basketball from than the master? And he let me into the class. Knight walks in, stands right in front of me. I'm the only non-scholarship athlete in the room. How many of you ever had a coach that you absolutely hated? Dead silence for 30 seconds. And then a few of the guys in the room raised their hands just a little bit. Well, we didn't like all you little sons of bitches either. That's great. And then he lays out his rules for the class. You will be on time for every class. I lock the door when I come in. If you're late, you miss one class. The highest grade you will get in this class is a C. If you miss two classes, it's an F automatically. Unless I will accept an excuse if you can get the president of the university to sign it for you. 
And then he takes the it tells us that the class is going to be based on your notebooks. Your grade will be based on your notes. I will read your notebooks. I will find out if you've been paying attention or not, and that's how I will determine your grade. I went down immediately after the first lecture to drop an ad and dropped that some bitch because there was a television news course that I really wanted to take before I graduated and it was available. hundred percent. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't, yeah. That's, that's hilarious, man. And then a few years later, when I'm up and working in Alaska, where at Alaska? The, in Anchorage at the NBC affiliate in Anchorage as a reporter and anchor, this is tooth pizza is the way to go in Anchorage. Yeah. And, uh, Covering the Great Alaska Shootout. <laughs> Knight eviscerates a reporter for the local public radio station, for Alaska Public Radio, who covers basketball one weekend a year and gets, and the poor bastard gets assigned to his press conference. And he asks a question that Knight considers dumb. And Knight just rips him a new one. And at that point I said, no, dude, I'm an alumnus, but no. I know, I know this guy, he's a good reporter, but he doesn't know hoops and you just tore him a new one. You should have known better. And also just like, there's a fine, fine line between, you know, being a, a, a asshole. Yeah. And I was just going to be like, sort of not seeing through your own cult of personality. Like the more success you have, the more self-aware you have to be because it will, you know, that success and pub and adulation and public life will 100% of the time eat you up. If you were not super, super self-aware, you know, I mean, uh, uh, Chris, I'm, my next book is going to, it's called Springsteen, Springsteen Pizza, actually, is the title. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's, coming, uh, that's Penguin Random House. That's coming in the fall of 2022. I hope you'll check that out. Uh, Springsteen, Springsteen Pizza, the Chris Radcliffe story. Uh, uh, I'll tell you this one because my daughter has chimed in with the, how about the time you endangered the football team? Oh, all right, I like this. All right, Only Brad, because, because, because you're a football writer, first and foremost. Back in Indiana, um, back in the IU days, I actually was a manager for the Indiana football team under Lee Corso for a few weeks. This was one of the reasons why I was no longer a manager after a few weeks. At the time in oh, 1982, I was driving a 1967 Chevy pickup truck around campus. The kind that had the gas tank right up by the driver's door, if you remember those era trucks. And I had parked my truck up at Assembly Hall during, during fall workouts, during fall training camp before school opened. And we were all staying down at the Union. Now, if you know Lee Corso back in those days... I do know Lee Corso. So this is funny. Lee had a, a buddy of his named Al who had cerebral palsy. And I gave Al a ride down to the student union for dinner most nights where we were eating training table. So I'd pull up behind the field house. Al would jump in the truck in the front seat beside me. Well, about that time, about one of the, uh, one of the football players came out and said, Hey, can I get a ride down to the union? A few minutes later, before I could pull away, Six more guys came out of the locker room and said, hey, can we get a ride down to the Union? Before that, before I could pull away, I had 12 scholarship athletes in the back of this beat-to-shit 67 Chevy pickup truck riding on the bump stops as far as the springs would go because these were big 10 boys. Yeah, yeah. Big dudes in the back of the truck. I'm driving down to the Union about a mile and a half, and I'm going, please don't, God, don't let me kill anyone. If you killed the whole Indiana football team... No, I didn't, and it would have been a better had I done it, because... 
I mean, Indiana football sucked back. Well, what I'm saying is, is, is that it's like one hand clapping. Yeah, I mean, if you had done it, and would anyone have even noticed? Yeah, exactly. I pull up in front of the union at the hotel for the training table. There's an assistant coach sitting there out front with his jaw going, what the fuck are you doing? And I'm going, I'm sorry. I I tried to get out of there, but these guys just kept piling into the truck. I'm just and by the time it, it was 12, it was every, the entire tr- bed of the truck was full of scholarship athletes. And I'm going, dear God, don't let me kill anyone. Nobody got killed. Nobody fell out. Nobody got hurt. But within 24 hours, I was no longer a football manager oh, under no, Lee Corso. No, no. The, uh, yeah, you were the first mascot head he put on. Yeah. And as Dave Kuhn points out, if you're going to kill an entire football team, make it Florida, please. Oh, come on, Dave. That's, that's, that's too far. <laughs> you know, you're not going to... You're not going to get a free copy of uh, Springsteen, Springsteen Pizza. (laughs) But speaking of copies of Springsteen, Springsteen Pizza, we need to talk about this thing that you guys are doing, you and Julian are doing on the 16th of Uh, November. I mean, this is the best kept I've already bought my ticket for this. I, I bought a ticket for it the night I found out about it because I'm going, I don't need the signed copy of Pappy Land that comes with it. But I want to support the cause. So let's talk about this. So we have three events, and at each event, we are raffling off three bottles of Pappy. A 10, so an old rip, a 15, and a 20. And, uh, yeah, that's that's that one. Uh, I have a website. uh, I'm on Instagram. You can find the dates. There's a third-place bookstore in Seattle, then... uh, uh, Prairie Lights in Iowa City, and then Square Books in Oxford. But each event, we're raffling off three bottles. It's capped at 2,500 people to protect your odds. I mean, people are buying 10 tickets at a time. It's pretty funny. Uh, but this is a really good – I mean, it's a, it's a pretty good shot to win one. And, uh, uh, you know, the – I did it to support the Lee Initiative that Chef oh, Edward Lee is putting oh, Lee Initiative. So, so like, with every ticket, we make a donation. With every raffle ticket, we make a donation to the Lee Initiative. They have a restaurant workers relief fund. I mean, like, I don't know, you know, if you if you know people who are working in restaurants during COVID, uh, I mean, a lot of them- They're screwed. Know, they're screwed. Tips are like, you know, the, the folks in the dish pit and working the line, I mean, business is down. That you know, shit rolls downhill, and uh, so people are really struggling. And so this is. Uh, I love to go to bars and restaurants, and I find great communion in them, and a uh, real sense of community. And and you know, I, I feel like a really great bar and a restaurant, a really great bar and a restaurant. You almost like can leave some part of yourself there that you get to then commune with every time you come back. And so I love love this this. Lee Initiative Restaurant Workers Relief Fund. So every ticket makes a donation to that. Uh, Julie and I are doing a virtual Q&A, so you can come grilling, which is funny. I love to see him on the hot seat. It makes me happy. Well, that's going to be fun. I'm going to do oh, it just for it. that alone. Oh, I love it. it, it like, it, I will 100% not bail him out if somebody... No, I'm just going to sit there and laugh. Oh, hell, I expect you to grill his ass. Good. Oh, oh, I'm, oh, I'm going to eat him up. And... uh, uh I spent so much time around him now that I'm like, all right, it's game off, dude. He didn't uh, get any approval over the book, did he? You know, the one thing, it, this is really interesting. There was one thing he asked me not to do after the fact. And it was, he had gone in a little bit on someone else in the bourbon industry. And he knew I was writing it all down. And he wanted... He asked me if I would not do that. And his reasoning was all of the reasons I was citing, I don't even know if those are true. Like, I just don't like the guy. And I don't think I was being fair. And it just feels sort of classless. So uh, I took that out or didn't use that. Uh, I felt, I don't know, man, you spent four years with a guy and like, that's the thing he asked you. That's an easy yeah. guess. 
but uh not that part about fucking up the baton toss or anything no, like that no i mean no but like it, it, and in some ways like i found that I, I found that to be like really authentic of the person i'd gotten to know and that was a, that was an easy yes uh but no he's he's pretty unplugged As Chris Ratcliffe points out, this is certainly the cask strength unfiltered broadcast tonight. Yep. Graham Frazier wants to know, is my Weller bourbon the closest thing to Pappy? Which Weller? Yeah. Which, yeah, it depends on which Weller, yeah. Uh, you know, it used to be, remember that Black Maple Hill that was Stitzel Weller? That stuff was great. It was in the purple bottle. Do you have, Not the squat green one that's done in Oregon. Yeah. The tall... I think it was purple writing. Do you have one still? I used to buy that by the case. No, I don't have one, but what I have, and I bet you have, you've not had this one, is a Weller Antique 107. This was a double bat, double cask batch that Ryan Maloney at Julio's Liquors up in Boston, in the Boston area, put together where he talked them into letting him blend two casks. And I think that's absolutely outstanding. Yeah, that's that. I mean, all that Weller stuff is really, really good. Uh, I've got a little way, bit of this left, right? I'll send you a sample of it. I would love that. I'll uh, send. I'll send some down to you. And you know, like, and by the way, if you can get Maker's Mark from the eighties. Oh yeah. Like you know, Maker's Mark has changed. It's totally changed. Uh, Julian has so up in Michigan. Uh, uh, somebody like bought some old house up there or I forget how but anyway gave him a bunch of handles of like 1980s Maker's Mark and so uh, he like you pull those things out I mean that stuff's unbelievable you know and this is like like so I, I went to dinner with John T uh, we went to Doe's the other night in Greenville, Mississippi to eat a steak. And I want to take some really good bourbon. So uh, my brother-in-law is a bartender at Bourbon Steak in uh, in Nashville. Uh, uh, his name is Seth Weinberg, and he does a bunch of like vintage spirit programs as a consultant. So he has all sorts of crazy old shit. And he gave me this old pint of 1970s old charter. It was eight years old. Yeah. And it was unbelievable. So I, I bought five more pints from him. Uh, by the way, I paid four hundred dollars for five pints. So someone tell me if I got a good deal or if I got robbed. You got a good deal for okay. that. It's unbelievable. Hey, I'm not going to complain. I'm not going to tell anybody they didn't get a good deal. If you like the whiskey and you paid for it, I'm not going to tell you you got a bad deal. If, it, if you like it that much, go for it. Um, yeah, and I really liked it. It was good. I am betting that Dave Kuhn asks, what is Julian Van Winkle's favorite bottling? I'm betting it's that single cask that uh, you told me he uh, did yeah, from the 2017s. But you, you got to understand, I mean, his favorite bottling is anything that has Stitzel Weller juice in it. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, they had that the Van Winkle Family Reserve the bourbon that has the label that looks like the rye label looks now. I don't know if you ever seen any of those. Yeah. But that was like 84, 85. That stuff's bonkers because that's, I mean, that's 1968 Stitzel Weller. Uh, you know, he loves, it's funny because Julian, before Sissy made him stop, uh, Ju us, Julian would get on the internet at night and buy old fits. So he's got a ton of old Fitzgerald, which is what he loves. Yeah, let's tell that story because uh, Julian loved the old Fitz that came out of Stitzel Weller, and that's what the flagship bourbon was. And it's yes, it's a Heaven Hill product now, and I don't know if you've tried the bottled in bonds that they've released. I haven't. But they're not bad, but it's still not the same as the Stitzel Weller old Fitz. No, I mean, that... that, that, that old Fitzgerald and the very old Fitz and the very, very old Fitz. I mean, that stuff is bonkers. Uh, it's really good. I really like that. 
and so does he. And I mean, it's also, you know, he tells a story when he was like 16 or 17, he was working at the distillery and they were emptying a barrel and something screwed up and an entire barrel of bourbon was dumped on his head. And he says he has such clear memories of how it tasted, how it smelled, how it felt on his skin. And in a lot of ways, it's, in some ways his palate is, goes back to that moment. I mean, it, it was really, uh, I don't know, like something got inside him, you know? I mean, he was like, he, he, he talks very specifically about how that was the first time he really understood how great this stuff was and how great it smelled and how he felt like he'd been dunked in it. Almost like a uh, baptism. You know, it's interesting. I mean, a lot like that. I mean, that's, you know, I don't want to make a joke, but yeah, like a hundred percent. Oh, hell, go for it. No, no, but like legitimately, I don't want to mock him. I mean, I think he would say that that's not that far off. I think he would tell you that that story is closer to the closer to the mystic than the fun. Dave Kuhn, are there more memories in a glass of bourbon or in a glass of scotch? I'd say it depends on who you're with at the time. Well, and also it just depends on what you grew up drinking and what you, yeah. you know, I mean, like, I, I sort of think there is no grand unified theory of great. You know, if, if you grew up drinking the number two bottle at the Royal and Ancient Golf Club, that's going to be where your memories are. If you grew up drinking Old Charter, or if you grew up drinking Maker's Mark, or if, you know, if, if, if you know, if your, if your granddad always had a bottle of Lagavulin or whatever it is, I mean, like, it, it, these things are very, very personal. And so, you know, I sort of find and you, there is no there is no Dow of bourbon or whiskey. There is no one true way to me, you know. And I, it's like I don't drink it neat. Like I like bourbon on the rocks. Julian drinks it on the rocks with a twist, unless it's twenty three, and then that's usually with just a little bit of water because he says it needs the water, just a drop or two. But uh, like I don't think there is a right way or a wrong way to do it. I mean. It, uh, Chris, to steal another Bruce Springsteen line, there is no right or wrong way to do it. There's just doing it. And yep. uh, uh, you can read all about that. And uh, <laughs> that's funny, Dave. That's true. There are no memories. <laughs> what are you talking about? Uh, uh, and let's yeah. pose this question. You got a unicorn dram? What have you not tried that you'd love to try? Well, I mean, God, I'm going to piss people off. Uh, Go for it. No, I mean, because like I had... There isn't, because I had so much crazy shit doing this book. Okay, uh, right, right. Do you know what? Look at the what, shelves behind me. I got crazy shit like you won't believe. You know what so, I would yeah, like? so go for it. Do you know what I would really like? I would really like some, like, really, really old, like, some, an Armagnac or a Cognac or, like, like something like, and again, it's not for the taste, it's for the the moment of sort of transcendent union. You know, it's like this was Napoleon's. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like I would like something like that. Yeah. Because I've had the privilege to try, well, until, at least until about a couple of weeks ago, the oldest Scotch whiskey ever ever bottled, which was the uh, 75 year old Mortlock at the time. There's now a 78-year-old McAllen that I have not yet tasted and probably will never get to. But there are some Glenn Grants that don't even start to get good until they hit 30 years age of age. And when they hit 60, they're just starting to get great. What happens? Because it's not like, you know, it's I mean, just, they're not in a, they're it's not a mystery. In a barrel. Yeah, I mean, that's what's interesting is like, especially, you know, you know, things that are pulled out of the barrel. I've always wondered, like, you know, one of the things Julian talks about all the time is how fast whiskey oxidizes, like how fast it goes funky. Uh, it's just interesting how fragile it is. And as Dave, <laughs> as Kuhn points out, I got crazy shit like you won't believe should be the masthead of the Whiskey Cast website. Yeah, yeah. Like, I yeah. Mean, if he pulls yep. some stuff out, that would just be like, oh. 
What you see behind me is only the start, guys. I'm sorry. It's like Willy Wonka's chocolate factory down here in the Bat Cave. <laughs> I'm sorry yeah. about that, guys. Well, but as Mars, go ahead. I'm go so ahead, we'll Mark. Tweet out your address. We'll just show up. Anytime you want to. As Marcel Dion points out, Dad always poured us a tall glass of red label. Many good memories with my brothers. The booze is just incidental. I agree Amen with that. to that. It's not just the whiskey. It's who you're making the memories with. And that's the best investment anybody can make in whiskey. That's what I think, too. I mean, I think, you know, it is the vehicle for a thing. It is not the thing itself. I want to close this out. Tell me about the dram you, the bottle you shared with your uncle the night oh, your yeah. daughter was born. Uh, What's well, interesting, like, uh, uh, so when I was packing my hospital bag, I took a, I had a 15 year old and I stuck it in the bag. And a 15 year old Van Winkle, let's put it that way. Yes. And, uh, and it was a, it was the 2000, it was the 2017. Uh, and, uh, my uncle had never, you know, had a bottle. And so uh, he, well, he's a doctor. And so he had his face pressed up against that door because they wouldn't let him back there. And he's not used to being in the hospital and not going wherever he wants. So finally, when everything was safe and I could come out and sort of tell him stuff, I walked out and I just put it in his hand. Uh, and uh, like, to me, that's what, you, I mean, that's what Van Winkle is. That's what great bourbon is. It is a million unbelievably complicated and difficult to articulate things made manifest in the sharing of something, whether you're sharing a drink with someone or, uh, or whether you're, uh, uh, you know, giving a bottle to someone. I mean, it's a way to say a whole lot of things that can sometimes be difficult to say. And I mean, it certainly was, I mean, you know, he drove home that day, that night, and uh, uh, he and my cousins uh, had a toast to Wallace. I mean, that's what, that's, like, at the end of the day, that's why we're all here. <sighs> that's what this, I mean, what this does is, it's not just the whiskey, it's the memories I've always said the best investment you can make in whiskey is not to buy a cask, but to make memories with it that will last far longer than the bottle ever does. Absolutely. This is a great pleasure. I really appreciate uh, the invitation. Right. As uh, Crumpler points out, make Wright a permanent co-host. Right, you've got a standing invitation. Anytime you want to come on the show, brother, you're welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, hey, how's uh, how's Ole Miss going to do tomorrow against Vanderbilt? And I don't know. <laughs> sometimes we're real good. Sometimes we're real, real bad. Uh, I, I, I mean, we're going to win, but you know, eighty-seven to eighty-one. You know, <laughs> one of those games where if you don't, it's like PlayStation. Like if you don't score every time. Yeah. Yeah. But. Uh, Look, man, this was this is really great. I really appreciate it. Hey, thank you once again. The book is called Pappy Land. Guys, if you're out there, buy this book. I'm serious. It is the best book I have read in a long, long time. You will learn far more about yourselves than you will learn about whiskey from this book. But I guarantee you, it will touch a nerve. And if it doesn't touch a nerve, you're dead. <laughs> uh, well, that, you know, I have nothing to add to that. 100%. Thanks so much right. for your time. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. For, right. I appreciate it. Let me uh, say good night to everybody here. Good night. Uh, <laughs> so thank you for watching, everybody. Um, we will be back next Friday night with another happy hour webcast. Uh, thank you for joining us. Don't forget to join us for the Whiskey Cast podcast this weekend. And uh, we will uh, see you next Friday night. Thanks again, Slotcha. Take care of yourselves. If you haven't mailed your vote yet or your ballot yet, get your butt to the, the uh, ballot box and put it in yourself because it's too damn late to mail it now. And hopefully we'll all be together again a week from tonight. Good night, everybody. <laughs>